afternoon. Um, my name is Diane DeFazio, and I am a member at large for the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the Association of College and Research Libraries, a division of the American Library Association. Today is Friday, December 4th, 2020, and welcome to a few of our favorite things, the kickoff event for Getman's virtual bibliophilic holiday gift fair. On behalf of the panelists and myself, we are honored to be here today and we thank you for joining us. Today, I am speaking from Osage Lands. I'm going to share my screen, so please hold. So, right. <laughs> today I am speaking from Osage Lands, and if you would like to know more about the indigenous forebears on your location, we encourage you to check it out at native-land.ca. For those in our audience who are blind or may have low vision, I am a woman of Mediterranean descent with shoulder length black hair, and I'm wearing a brocade black jacket. You are joining our broadcast live today via YouTube. This broadcast is being recorded. To view captions, we recommend that you use webcaptioner.com, which is a service that uses the speakers on your computer and the Chrome browser. Again, that URL is webcaptioner.com. Please add your comments and questions in the chat window on YouTube. That chat will be monitored by me, and we will get to your questions at the end of the session. As I mentioned, today's panel is brought to you by Getman's Virtual Fair, which opens today at bookandpaperfairs.com slash virtual. It runs through Monday, December 7th. There are featured 230 dealers and over 3,000 items listed for sale. The fair will add an additional 600 items on Monday and is sponsored by Fine Books and Collections Magazine, and we thank them for their support. Our presenters. Today our presenters are Julie Park, Jonathan Kearns, Brendan Edwards, Agnieszka Shablakov, and Colleen Barrett. Please join me in welcoming them. You can read their biographies at bit.ly forward slash RBMS December 20 panelists. Today the panelists invite you into their collections, representing the quintessential in rare books, compelling personal narratives, jazz materials, significant local histories, and the traces of readership. The speakers will shed new light on special collections in Canada, the Midwest, New York City, New Orleans, and the UK. Each panelist will present for seven to 10 minutes and we will conclude with a group question and answer session. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome our first speaker, Julie Park. While Julie is getting set up, let me introduce her. Julie is assistant curator and faculty fellow in the Special Collections Center of New York University's Bob's Library as well as an interdisciplinary scholar of 17th and 18th century England, working at the crossroads of literary studies, material and visual culture, and textual materiality. Julie, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Diane, for organizing this. Um, thank you, Marvin, for organizing the fair. And thank you so much, Neko, for being the technical facilitator. Um, I think we should start showing the, the PowerPoint show now. Okay, so if you start from the, the first slide, please. I'd like to, um, I'm excited about sharing with you my favorite item in um, NYU Special Collections. Um, if you could go to the first slide, please. It's a hand colored copy of the 1607 edition of William Camden's Britannia. Britannia was first published in 1586. Um, next slide, please. The 1607 edition I'm showing you is the sixth edition. 
First, I think it's most useful to talk about who William Camden was, as well as what kind of work Britannia was doing. Knowing this information is key to really grasping what makes this book object so unique and why I can say that it's my favorite um, book in the collection. Next slide, please. William Camden was a prominent antiquarian who was born in 1551 in London and died in 1623. Um, the question I think that should be asked is what is an antiquarian? In the Renaissance and the 18th century, antiquarians were men who studied the ancient material remains of England's past. These remains included buildings, ruins, and artifacts in the next slide, such as coins, um, such as coins, heraldry, and funerary inscriptions found in different areas of England. Camden's aim in writing Britannia was an antiquarian one. He wanted to make knowledge about Britain's ancient past, especially its Roman past, known to a wide audience. He is regarded, in fact, as being the first to integrate the direct study of ancient art artifacts with written historical information. Next slide, please. In the preface to Britannia, he declares his purpose in writing it is to restore antiquity to Britain and Britain to his antiquity. An emphasis on material remains distinguishes the antiquarian from a historian and makes him more similar to an archeologist. So you can say that an antiquarian is a combination of an archeologist and historian. And I like to look at William Camden and other antiquarians as pioneers in primary source learning because of their emphasis on learning about the past through directly studying its artifacts. Brit Britannia, the book is itself one of the first works of British antiquarianism. The second point I wanna make about Camden's book is that the work of antiquarians was combined with the equally new work of choreography. And in the next slide, you see that word in the title, um, in the next slide, in tiny letters in Latin. In a more visible place in the seventh edition title page, if you look in the next slide, um, translated into English, you can see the subtitle, in the subtitle, the word choreographical is enlarged. A choreographical description of the most flourishing kingdoms England, Scotland, and Ireland, and the islands adjoining out of the depths of antiquity. Choreography is the act of describing or delineating a particular region or district. Being a choreographer means that Camden, as an antiquarian, was also a road warrior. He traveled and went to the places he was studying in order to study them. He saw in person the counties sites and artifacts he described. And to give a more um, a direct sense of what choreography entailed, here are Camden's own words to describe this aspect of his project. In the next slide, in my treatise of each county, I will show as much with as much plainness and brevity as I can, who were the ancient inhabitants? What was the reason of a name? What are the bounds of the county, the nature of the soil, the places of greatest antiquity and most eminent at present? So given all this, the book itself bears the task of representing to the reader a view of Britain that one, reveals its ancient heritage through closely examining its remaining artifacts and two, representing its individual counties and regions as spatial territories. With each progressive edition, Britannia became larger and more bibliographically elaborate. Though the 1607 edition I'm showing you is the sixth edition, it's the first in two critical regards. One, it's the first folio size volume of Britannia, so it's the first large size one. Second, it's the first to come illustrated with several maps of the places that Camden discusses, as well as images of coins, inscriptions, and ruins that I just showed you. This sixth edition boasts of its new inclusion of maps in its subtitle, and the engravings were done by William Kipp and William Hull. So I want to now explain to you why this is my favorite item in the NYU collection. And next slide, please. 
The subjective experience of reading this particular copy is utterly delightful. To put it simply, the intellectual significance of the book, which I've just explained, is interesting and important. But this significance is altogether different from the pleasure of pouring over a copy of the book, such as this NYU copy, whose prints are completely hand colored. It's an extremely sensuous experience um, that demands experiencing the physical copy of the book. And there's no way to have the same experience digitally. Next, next slide. So the expectation when seeing the book cover is that it'll be a standard folio sized 17th century book with black and white prints and text inside like most other books from the hand press period. But instead, opening it is like discovering a dense garden, as in the next slide, with plants and flowers of many colors, or a jewel box overflowing with many different colored gemstones. Next slide, please. And you get the full sense of this when you compare an uncolored print, like as in the next slide, with a colored one. And you can see this in the two slides showing the uncolored version of the map of Kent in this slide. And in the next slide, the colored version. I've seen books with plates that have been partially colored, but I've never seen one of this slide with every single plate colored. Um, every single decorative element is colored too. Next slide, from the drop cap and historiated initials to the printer's ornaments. Next slide. The antiquities themselves are colored. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. Like the inscriptions and the coins. Next slide. Um, here you can see the contrast in the coins between a colored version of the plate and an uncolored one. Most likely the coloring was professionally done in the print shop. And given that the other copies of this edition that I've seen are uncolored, the coloring was probably done later by hand as opposed to a printing press. Um, colored prints have tended to be devalued by art historians, collectors, because the use of color suggests that the print can't stand um, on its own and it's inferior in some way. So in this way, the color is regarded, it was regarded as a cosmetic enhancement. I was originally interested in this book because I'm including it in the exhibition I'm organizing at NYU called The Interactive Book. Um, so the notion of interactivity would seem to work much better with this book if it could be established that the color was, was done by a reader. But I think that the act of having the book colored by a professional in a print shop still indicates the book's interactive element. Um, this book and the memory of engaging with it really stayed in my head after I first encountered it. And I wanted to understand why um, I became very interested in color. So what is it about color that makes things more vivid, lifelike and engaging? What role does it play in the experience of a book, a space that's dominated by black print against white surfaces? Another question I pondered was, why might the hand colored version be integral to antiquarianism in general? The literary scholar David Kasten and artist Stephen Farthing point out in their 2018 book on color that we use color to construct the world we live in. Whereas the sensation of color is physical, the perception of color is cultural. So this statement indicates that color is always interactive and this description of color seems apt for what Camden himself was doing in constructing a map-like view of Britain that made its ancient origins and elements visible. Camden was, in other words, bringing the past to life with Britannia and showing readers how the past surrounds them in their present lives in different counties. The addition of color has the effect of making things like the coins and inscriptions seem three-dimensional. And the last slide, please. With maps, color allows you to see borders and boundaries better, as well as different land formations like forests and mountains. Just as Camden experienced the past through direct physical encounters with its artifacts in their original environments, the hand-colored version of Britannia brings that direct encounter to the reader. We live in a world of color, not black and white. And to render Britannia's maps 
artifacts, inscriptions, and general textual environment in color, as this copy of Campton's book has done, is to make the past very much a part of our lives today. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. It's a really wonderful, amazing book. Um, I'm really excited about that. So thank you so much for sharing that bit of NYU's collections with us. Up next, we have Jonathan Kearns. Jonathan Kearns is the sole owner and proprietor of Jonathan Kearns Rare Books and Curiosities. And Jonathan will tell us a little bit more about a fascinating personal archive. And I'm going to share my screen one more time so you can get a look at those items. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everybody. Can everyone hear me? I hope so. Technology is not my friend on certain occasions like this. Um, right. Well, my favorite thing that I, that I currently work with, um, I've been working on this for like um, over a year, year and a half now. Um, and it is the, it is a woman's entire life. It is the life of a woman called uh, Judith Marilyn, uh, Madeline Ferrier of uh, Great Yarmouth in East Anglia or on the Eastern side of Britain. Um, she was born in about 1902 and died in about 1970. And the collection runs from, the first entry is her aged about 12 or 13, describing the first Zeppelin raid of the First World War, which landed on uh, Great Yarmouth. And is a uh, Zeppelin raid last night on the North Coast, 15 killed, 15 wounded, with a little crayon drawing of a Zeppelin being shot at. It's absolutely gorgeous and horrible and fantastic at the same time. And the last entry is the day before she went into hospital uh, in her late 60s, early 70s, um, saying that she's uh, saving, saving her strength for the next day. Um, the, the thing that is absolutely wonderful about this, to me anyway, this is all a very personal thing, is that, that is the tremendous privilege of, of handling and dealing with somebody else's whole life. So this, all of the detritus and all of the sediment and all of the, all of the, the photographs and the letters and the, the various feelings and correspondences and all the rest of it that we, that we call a life, it's all just sitting here. It's sitting here in four boxes. Um, bound in various different types. It's about 70 items altogether. About 40 of them are her diaries. Um, then there's a whole stack of photo albums, which are absolutely stuffed. There's a, there's a note in my catalog description, which is, um, side note, in the context of this collection, usually when I say diary, what I actually mean is hardback octavo stuffed until the hinges are springing with text, photographs, cinema programs, postcards, concert tickets, costume details, pressed flowers, bits of grass, pasted in maps, a couple of which are hand drawn, newspaper clippings, Christmas cards, etc. Um, several volumes present here aren't just diaries, they are basically time capsules just waiting for the correct technology so that the entirety of 1920s Paris or Great Yarmouth can be recreated in their detailed entirety. That to me, finding something like this and having something like this in, in, my, in my collection as it were, uh, is, is the equivalent of accidentally happening upon a really rich gold scene. It's, it's what you do this for. Strata of the rare book trade. Um, and they vary between, I can purchase and resell the same 15 books again and again and make a lovely living. And at the other end, there is also, I think I'll just go down this big, deep, dark hole of complete weirdness and see what happens at the other side, present it and see if anybody else has any interest in it other than me. And I think I probably ended up with a stock that consists of many things that I am deeply fascinated in, but probably fewer people out there are as fascinated with them as I am, but this probably falls into that category. Um, she grew up around the, the, the Norfolk Broads in the, the early part of the 20th century, 1920s, 1930s. Um, she was an incredibly keen ornithologist. She is responsible for the founding of several bird sanctuaries. She's a terribly independent young woman. Her family, the Ferrier family, is one of those British families that dates itself back to the 14th century, quite cheerfully, you know, just this is what we did. Um, in the 16th and 17th century, they were, they were notable um, uh, merchant traders uh, in that, that region of Britain. Um, terribly wealthy. Uh, by the time it gets to Judith, they're not so terribly wealthy, but she still has the ability to, to uh, make her own way, decide pretty much what it is she wants to do. She reads continuously. Um, she is uh, massively invested in the Girl Guides. She's massively invested in uh, church retreats. She, she does um, 
magic lantern slides of various ornitholo ornithological weirdnesses um, all across Europe. She goes to France and Holland and delivers lectures. And this is all while she's a relatively young woman. Um, she's fascinated with travel. Several of the diaries are basically um, incredibly detailed accounts of Paris or Munich or whatever in this, these sort of 1920s, 1930s sort of period. So she's, she's, she's forging for herself this sort of weirdly independent life. She never marries. Um, she's clearly quite family oriented. Um, her younger brother dies at the age of 18 on HMS Sandpiper during the First World War. Um, there's several of his pieces in there as well. There's several of his diaries. Um, a little photograph album and a really strange piece of boys own adventure fiction about joining the war which is terribly sad and poignant to read um he's very much a, a he's very much a schoolboy. he's he doesn't ever give the impression of having got older than 12 and yet he's gone off to fight in this this enormous conflict um she dedicates herself to uh learning as much about uh, nature and flora and fauna as she possibly can she studies um, informally under this man who he's kind of slightly famous in his own right. His name is Arthur Patterson, and but he wrote under the name John No Little. Uh, he lived uh, on, a, on a houseboat near Great Yarmouth. Uh, I live on a houseboat. Um, and he was one of those bizarre Arthur Ransom type creations who had fish and horse bait in his pockets and was close friends with all of the local traveling communities. Um, and basically spent most of his time smoking a pipe, sitting on his boat and staring at bitterns and various other birds, just, you know, learning as much as he possibly could and passing it on. And he's an example of one of those people who's just been almost totally forgotten. Um, yet they used to be fairly prevalent. There were a few still around when I was a young boy. Um, and that was a long time ago. But anyway, um, she, as I said, she traveled quite considerably. Um, all of this is taking place against, well, in the, the main part of the 20th century, two world wars, endless conflicts. Um, and during this time, she's, she's suffering the usual tragedies, or not the usual tragedies, but some quite specific tragedies that other people, you know, don't necessarily share. Uh, two, whole, two world wars, numerous other conflicts, her parents gradually aging, her father slipping into dementia. And her life is this beautiful, tapestry of sort of almost like a it's like if someone designed somebody to be an archetypal British schoolgirl and then just sort of trapped them and never allowed them to get any older so she's traveling and she's going all over these she never once loses her sense of absolute wonder and she never ever slows down she just keeps going and going and going for the entirety of her 60 odd years or 70 years of life and um, there's a she's surrounded all, for her whole life with um other women of a similar mindset but they're all they're all called like jack and toby and punch and they're out helping her and there's never any sort of settling down for her there's never any feeling that she wants to have a two up two down house or a you know or a husband or children or any of those things and she's constantly reading and learning but her tastes she reads um British adventure fiction Ryder Haggard lots of Conan Doyle and things like that she thinks Byron is tremendously overrated which is yeah, you go. Um, and she's she's terribly enthusiastic and occasionally veers into the sort of sort of teenage goth kind of kind of level of writing when she's talking about herself. And there's um there's a fantastic little little caption piece. Where are we? Every event is charmingly described with the dramatic intensity of a silent movie caption. It was quite dark this morning when we were called, as we were about to leave the house for England at eight. We were all very excited, but were kept within bounds by the consciousness of the deep sorrow of the six unfortunate girls left behind for the holidays and the ever-present vision of the stormy deep we were about to cross. This is Judith going home for her school holidays. Uh, that's, that's it. You'd think that she was boarding the Titanic and had some sort of prescient vision, but that, that's, she's like that the whole time. And the last entry of her diary uh, in 1970, March, is um, a very quiet day to reserve my strength for tomorrow legs still very painful. And the, the, the tremendous, like I said, earlier, privilege and honor of, of having somebody's entire life to, to, to disappear into and to, to explore and to search through between the Zeppelin raid and going into hospital. She, she stuffed those 68 years or so with, with learning and travel and enjoyment and yet still lived what we can describe as a very ordinary life. And I think that that basically is the key to all this. I think we've kind of lost 
our understanding of the importance of people's ordinary lives. I think instead, I mean, if you want to buy this, it will cost you one third of a decent Ian Fleming first edition, but it's tremendously much more significant and important. And I think that this year particularly has taught us that we hold life far too cheaply and we ordinary lives on a much more practical and, and everyday basis rather than just looking for the highlights. And uh, I think that's, and that's basically it. She's just my favorite thing because she's like a companion. And uh, I think that that's, that's, that's something that should be sought after when building collections and when, when building the stock of a bookshop or whatever. I think we've kind of, I think we've kind of drifted away from that. We could probably do with drifting back. And I think that that's a rather muddled little emotional codicil at the end there is, is probably where I'll end it before I start getting all, all weird. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing her story again. Um, I really love the pictures and the rest of uh, the accounts of her life. It's just an amazing collection and I'm so glad you got to share it with us today. So thank you. No problem at all. Thank you. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at the moment while we prepare for our next speaker. All right. So our next speaker is Brendan Edwards, who is the recently appointed curator of rare books and special collections at Queen's University Library in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Um, and he is just getting to know the great collections there. So we thank him for joining us today. He's the author of Paper Talk, A History of Libraries, Print Culture, and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada Before 1960. And this morning, he will share a bit on a very special copy of a book that's familiar to Rare Books fans. Brendan, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am situated on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples in Cataraque on the north shore of Lake Ontario. As Diane mentioned, I'll be speaking to you this morning about my new favorite thing. Uh, I just started this position at Queen's under two months ago and the Jordan Rare Books and Special Collections Library at Queen's University has a rather unique copy of the Nuremberg Chronicle. The Nuremberg Chronicle is written by Hartman Schettel, uh, was financed by leading Nuremberg merchants and illustrated by leading Nuremberg artists and features 645 separate woodcuts and a text aimed at covering world history up to 1493. Published in 1493 uh, in an estimated 2,500 copies, 1,500 in Latin and 1,000 in German, today an estimated 800 Latin copies and 408 German copies survive, which is an unusually large number of 15th century uh, for a 15th century book. Queen's University's copy was acquired in 2018 thanks to a generous gift uh, from renowned philanthropist Seymour Schulich. So in the theme of gifts and holidays and giving, this is one of our wonderful gifts that has been given to our collections. Queen's University's copy of the Nuremberg Chronicle is fascinating and unique because it was extensively colored and annotated in 1521 by its original owner, Johann Kruschar of Lipstadt, who was also known by his Latinized name, Johannes Cincinius. Cincinius was a Westphalian humanist priest employed at the Abbey of Worden, where he served as librarian, scribe, and confessor to the abbots. It's rather remarkable to have a copy of the Chronicle that's not only signed by the person who colored and annotated it, but who was also a contemporary reader. The Chronicle exemplifies how quickly printing changed in the 40 years after Gutenberg. Woodcut illustrations are successfully integrated into the layout of almost every page. As a world history based on the Bible, the Chronicle includes numerous biblical images from creation to the last judgment. The first five books or ages of human history depict scenes from the Old Testament. 
And beginning in the sixth age, the life of apostles, Jesus' disciples, and saints and martyrs are portrayed. It concludes in 1493 with a decidedly European and local focus and a brief introduction to the seventh age or what was perceived to be the end of the world. Johannes Sincinius's annotations are, and marginalia are evident on almost every single page. Here's an example of one of the many manicules or little hands inserted by Sincinius to draw attention to aspects of the text that were of particular note and interest to him. Sincinius was a humanist intellectual of some regional significance in early 16th century Westphalia. He was one of the most productive hagiographers of the era. He published A Life of St. Ludger in 1515. Sincinius is known to have creatively reconfigured the geographical settings of saints, making them more German. He fashioned the social and political settings within which the saints lived to meet contemporary late 15th and early 16th century regional, political, cultural, and social conceptions. In doing so, Sincinius was making a contribution to Westphalian regional consciousness and pride. Scholars have argued that his life and spiritual interests were representative of those of many other humanist intellectuals of that period in Northwestern German lowlands. Sincinius's annotations provide a unique window into the readership history of this text. Often referred to nowadays as the first coffee table book, the annotations in our copy show how much sacred history mattered to readers like Sincinius. The annotations and marginalia are marks and modes of use, highlighting the chronicle as a material object. Sincinius's annotations also demonstrate the relationship of manuscript to print. He takes design inspiration from the print text and uses a remarkably clear and legible hand. The Chronicle famously depicts European cities of the late 15th century. Sincinius even annotates many of the city depictions, almost as though he was using the Chronicle as a kind of guidebook. Perhaps most striking of Sincinius's annotations are numerous spiders drawn beside the saints that he and contemporary church, the contemporary church considered to be heretics. Although Sincinius's spiders feature only six legs, uh, we argue that they are indeed spiders. In medieval times, it was a commonly held belief that only the appendages that the arachnid used for walking counted as legs. This incorrect but often repeated observation stem back as far as Aristotle. Sincinius's annotations and coloring changes his status from mere reader and consumer to a collaborator. His reading would have been punctuated by very close attention to the details in each image. And I'd add that practically every illustration in our copy is colored and practically every page includes annotations. In several places, we even see evidence of Sincinius blotting his pen as though he's absentmindedly doing so as he carefully ponders what he's reading. Shettle famously follows the end of the section on the sixth age of human history with several blank pages encouraging readers to record history post 1493. Sincinius uses the blank pages in our copy to catalog the abbots at the Abbey of Werden. The names that Sincinius records provide an opportunity to study the history of this particular abbey and he includes a chronology of past abbots as well. The blank pages in our copy amount to three pages, leaving not a lot of room to record future history. And some scholars have argued that this reflects the belief by Shettle and his contemporaries that the world would end in his own generation or shortly thereafter. Shettle writes, look on these bones, this ultimate home, a reminder that death and the grave awaits us all. How's that for some Christmas uh, cheer? Towards the end of the Chronicle, Sincinius Sincinius's annotations actually become more numerous.
Central Europe is depicted, including the cities mentioned in the text, uh, notably and perhaps tellingly, although written in the age of discovery, there's no direct mention of Christopher Columbus's voyages, for example, or the New World. Under the colophon, Cincinnius clearly details when he colored and annotated the chronicle. And it appears to me, at least, that Cincinnius likely spent months, if not years, carefully reading, coloring, and considering the Nuremberg Chronicle. In other words, he was a deeply engaged reader. This text image hybrid is an early example of multimedia, providing a unique and fascinating window into the late 15th century, and more specifically, the worldview of an early 16th century Westphalian abbot and librarian. If you'd like to learn more about this special copy of the Nuremberg Chronicle, uh, a couple of professors here at Queen's University have recently published this paper and they highlight uh, some of the other unique ish aspects of our copy. Uh, I'd like to thank, your, your, thank you for your attention uh, this morning, this afternoon, and uh, I look forward to your questions if they come up later and I look forward to the rest of uh, the panel's conversations. Marvelous. Thank you, Brendan. I know a lot of us love the Nuremberg Chronicle anyway, and it's always great to see the evidence of readership and the pondering that you've described is just marvelous. So thank you. Up next, we have Agnieszka Chablokov. Agnes is head of research services at Tulane University Special Collections and has a background in jazz and Latin American history. Agnes, you'll tell us more about a specific item or two at your collection. Please go ahead. Thank you, Diane. Um, I will share my screen right now. Um, thank you, Diane, for um, inviting me to this panel. And thank you, um, fellow panelists, for your um, exciting favorite objects. Um, today, I want to talk about um, kind of my favorite object that has become um, favorite because of what it does when I use it for instruction. It, it has become kind of an onion that gets uh, peeled further and further as I use it every semester um, and its interpretation changes and mutates depending on what is happening in the world. Um, it's also a kind of an origin story and the story that we like to tell um, about our collections and um, kind of the foundational myths um, that we create about the collections and where the um, collections came from. So, um, and it, it, the, the, the favorite object will come at the very end of my um, presentation. So, to begin. Um, the William Renson Hogan Jazz Archive is the second oldest archival repository devoted to the study of New Orleans jazz and related musical genres, in, including New Orleans ragtime, gospel blues, rhythm and blues, and Creole songs. Its official story begins around 1957, 1958, with the collective efforts of three individuals. A prospective master student, Richard B. Allen, pictured here with his father, his faculty advisor and chair of the history department at Tulane University, Dr. William Hogan, and William Russell, a musician, record shop owner, a collector, New Orleans jazz expert, and a friend and confidant to most of the jazz practitioners in the city at the, at the time. In 1949, the 22-year-old Milledgeville, Georgia native, Richard Allen, moved to the Crescent City to pursue his interest in African-American music. By 1957, he was already a fixture in the French Quarter, becoming friends with Russell, spending time in his record shop, and befriending Black musicians, Black and white musicians who would become his future informants. At some point, he enrolled in the history program at Tulane University with an idea of basing his master's thesis on the tape recorded interviews with the jazz musicians. His advisor, Dr. Hogan, approved of the project as he himself was a jazz enthusiast, a collector of jazz records and a social historian. He was impressed by the materials and the interviews that Alan and Russell have already gathered. And together they conceived of an idea of establishing a research center quote, establishing a research center where scholars might come to study the musicians and their music, not only through recorded examples, books, periodicals, and photographs, but primarily through tape recorded interviews, end quote. The urgency of establishing such a center was compounded by the realization that the three of them had 
that, quote, many of the men who had been in the jazz milieu from the beginning were still alive here in New Orleans, but the ranks were thinning fast. But as we all know, such ambitious projects call for equally ambitious amounts of money. Hogan prepared the grant proposal and submitted it to the Ford Foundation and was awarded $75,000 for a five-year period between 58 and 63 to develop the archive and continue the recording, um, the oral history project. After two years, the project's founders realized that $75,000 was a drop in a bucket when undertaking an unprecedented and radical project such as theirs and requested additional funding. In 1965, with over 2,000 2, reels of taped interviews, the archive became a department within the Howard Tilton Memorial Library, and today it is part of the Tulane University Special Collections. And this is what the um, 2,000 reels of um, recorded oral histories looks like. It's 13 cases um, that are um, in our um, Stax areas. So this is where the um, official story ends. Um, this is the official story that we write about the beginnings of the Hogan Jazz Archive. Internal correspondence and Alan Personal's archives, however, reveal that the award quickly polarized not only the strange world of jazz and its denizens, who themselves were in search of their own origin, origins of jazz story, but reverberated locally where the establishment of the jazz archive and its oral history project began to peel layers of acrid animosities among persons and groups, as well as expose the white supremacy and racism that festered in the city that the care forgot. In the early years of acquisition of archival collections and recordings of interviews, wanting to preserve the archive's neutrality in the highly charged environment, Hogan shied away from national publicity and public access to the collection until the collection was fully organized, transcribed, quality checked, and cataloged. But the archive must go on, as he noted, and so it did. The taped interviews became the core of the heart of the collection, Reflecting on the genesis of the project, Ellen wrote in 1973 for another official brochure, this oral history becomes increasingly important as time passes because there are no documents concerning the initial development of jazz. Record companies were slow to become interested in jazz and the topic seemed too vulgar for music historians. The taped interviews have proved to be of interest to jazz musicians, anthropologists, sociologists, cultural historians, linguists, musicologists, and folklorists making contact, entering black homes, bars, and clubs, and socializing lay at the core of the oral history project envisioned by the trio. This required not only, quote, obtaining as relaxed an atmosphere as possible by the interviewees, but also aiming, quote, for the unexpected, end quote, and allowing interviewees to speak freely, reminisce, ramble, in order to bring out the most revealing statements, hidden facets of private and public lives, and to create vivid pictures of an era seen from a unique standpoint. In the 1950s, New Orleans, like all Southern cities, remained segregated and under the spell of Jim Crow laws. Even though throughout the 19th century, race relations in the city were somewhat more relaxed than the rest of the South, um, by the 1900, with the imposition of racial domination regime embodied in Jim Crow laws, New Orleans' unique racial situation began to resemble that of the rest of the South. Physical spaces from streetcars to schools to bars to swimming pools, playgrounds and water fountains were segregated. Laws banning interracial marriage and cohabitation existed on the books until 1970s. Jim Crow etiquette dictated everyday interactions between New Orleans residents. On February 9, 1959, Friend Cole, the Vice President of Tulane and the Ford Foundation's Program Officer for Education, penned a request to New Orleans Mayor Chep Morrison to request a signed statement that both Russell and Allen were engaged in a, quote, legitimate scholarly activity. Such statement, Cole explained, would, quote, alleviate any possible difficulties that might arise in the mixing of whites and blacks, and especially to avoid embarrassment with the New Orleans police. I do not know if mayor's office responded to the request, but we do know that Allen and Russell likely carried a copy of this letter issued by New Orleans police um, superintendent in 1959. And this is my favorite object um, from the archive. Um, today, the letter has become a centerpiece of many show and tells. It has been pasted to an oversized board, which you can see in the background, um, to preserve it. Um, it also has a lot of scotch tape um, also to preserve it as the creases have um, fallen apart. Um, 
I have been using it um, in instruction alongside oral histories to talk about materiality of objects and bureaucratic materials in particular, historical methods, neutrality and objectivity, challenges of oral histories as sources, and the ethics of archival collecting. Students are generally quick to point out to the obvious racial tensions embodied in the letter, the radical nature of the undertaking at that time, and the realities of Jim Crow South um, and the physical characteristics of the tattered letter um, really speak to them. This is the first thing that they hone in um, and realize that this was something that was probably carried in a pocket and taken out of a pocket or a wallet quite frequent, frequently. Since the uprisings this summer, um, the students have become much bolder in their analysis and interrogation of the letter and the official objective origin story that accompanies when I introduce the collections. This semester, a young woman asked as we were finishing discussion in a um, history class an art and craft of history and historical methods. She said, while Allen and Russell had protection from the police, what protections were extended to the black interviewees? Challenging her classmates and us, the librarian and archivist to turn our gaze to the creator, to the co-creators of the oral history projects and more deeply engage with the historical complexities privileges and challenges of white institutional collecting and its legacies and the stories that we craft for our promotional materials about them. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Egg. Um, I have one little quick comment. I just love how you managed to squeeze in as many nicknames of New Orleans as possible. That was also nice <laughs> for levity. Um, so we have come to our final presentation. Um, our final speaker is Colleen Barrett. She is the Rare Books Librarian at the University of Kentucky Special Collections Research Center, and she will tell us more about print history in her neck of the woods. Colleen, take it away. Thank you, Diane. Um, good morning, everyone, and greetings from my office in the Special Collections Research Center at the University of Kentucky. So today I'm gonna to tell you more than you probably ever wanted to know about Adam Rankin's A Process in the Transylvania Presbytery, uh, which is a late 18th century religious imprint that has been described as the first substantial monograph printed in Kentucky. And it's held here in our rare book collection. I admire what it can tell us about printing in Kentucky, Lexington as a city in the 18th and early 19th century, and also how texts like these may have survived to the current day. So probably the most important thing to know going into this is that I am a Kentucky resident by choice and not by birth. Um, I'm actually from Northern Indiana up near the St. Joseph River, which means most of my elementary school education was spent talking about French fur traders in the Great Lakes, as opposed to settlers moving west from the original American colonies to settle in a place that was at one point classified as Virginia. So when I realized a few years ago that Kentucky had letterpress printing before it was even a state, I knew I had both a new fun fact and a specific research interest within my larger one of early American printing. So you may not, you may not know this, but Kentucky's actually a powerhouse of Western American printing. So the first printers in Ohio, in Missouri, and the first Anglophone printer in Louisiana all got their start here. And the printing all started in Lexington, which is where I am now. The first known example of printing here was actually a newspaper called the Kentucky Gazette, which was started in August of 1787 by John Bradford. Even though it's the same last name, this Bradford didn't come from the Philadelphia Bradford family of printers. Rather, he was originally a surveyor that was known for being litigious and eventually took the job after promises of financial support from the government. Those seeking to make Kentucky a state as opposed to just continuing on as a section of Virginia had actually started a search for a printer in 1785, but they weren't able to convince anybody who had actually been trained to move somewhere that far away. So Bradford had no experience printing, but he had a confidence in my own mechanical talents and planned to get his five sons involved. So he got the job. Rankin's book has a copyright date of 1793, which is just one year after Kentucky became a state and was published here in Lexington at the sign of the Buffalo on Main Street by Maxwell and Cooch. So I haven't been able to find any more information on Cooch at this time, but the Maxwell named here is William Maxwell, who's Ohio's first printer and Lexington's second printer. I'm not sure if Maxwell had any training as a printer before he moved out west from New Jersey, but either way, he only printed up for a pretty short time. 
So after he made like at least two known imprints here, he took his stuff and moved up to Cincinnati. And he actually ended up selling all of his stuff in Cincinnati to someone else by 1796, when he decided to move to Dayton, Ohio and become a farmer and try out various other careers throughout the rest of his life. Now that you know a little bit about who made the book physically possible, we should probably talk about the general reputation of the city and how that could have helped make it worth printing in the first place. At one point, Lexington was actually known as the Athens of the West and was considered a more cosmopolitan area than both Louisville and Cincinnati. This is partially due to the establishment of Transylvania University in 1780, which was actually the first college established west of the Alleghenies and grew into a prominent educational institution over the following decades. This background might explain why someone like Pastor Adam Rankin would feel comfortable writing such a strongly worded argument against using Watts Psalms to church leaders in Philadelphia. I've always been a fan of strongly worded arguments from anywhere in print, especially if they created a series of back and forth arguments. But this one's especially struggling to me because it started in Lexington and deals with the city that I lived in before I came here. We don't have a copy of it, but it even seems like there was a much later response to the work written and published in Philadelphia, which I find kind of interesting. So the text I'm holding is actually a bound with of three related texts. Um, and the first one being Adam Rankin's work, which I mentioned, and is goes through about here. The second one is a reply to a narrative of Mr. Adam Rankin, also written by Adam Rankin, but published by J. Bradford in 1794 and goes to here. And then we finally have the final Rankin work, which is a review of the noted revival in Kentucky, which is from 1802 and also by Bradford and goes to this section. Um, speaking of bound widths, I feel like we should probably take a minute and appreciate this binding. So some of the texts still have their remnants of blue paper, blue paper wrappers, which is probably how they were distributed when they were originally published but not always in a way that makes sense, which kind of suggests this was done by someone who was just as much an amateur in printing or in book binding as in printing. Um, and I'm not sure about this or not, but the middle text is quite significantly longer than the two and seems to have been more inexpertly stitched in as the other two. So you can see that like someone didn't really know what they were doing as they were going along the sewing blocks which makes it even more charming to me. Um, having said that, this binding probably helps explain why we even have surviving copies of this text at all, uh, as might be expected from somewhat obscure texts not produced in a central publishing location. These three works are pretty uncommon with very few holdings reported to the STC of those that would fit in the time period, of course. Uh, by having them grouped together like this, there are more substantial text, and that means it's more likely for them to be kept rather than thrown away and to make it through a series of cleaning things out. I feel really fortunate to work somewhere with such a strong collection in this area, which was not gathered by accident. So UK Special Collections began, much like several other American universities, with a donation of a personal rare books and manuscripts collection. So Lexington Judge Samuel Wilson donated his early Kentucky history collection to the university in 1946. And we've continued to grow his collection since then, with the help of both an endowment and many other generous donors through time. This work comes from that original collection and you can even see Wilson's book plate on the front cover because of it. So a large part of the reason I think this is my favorite thing in the collection right now is that it manages to tell so many different stories at the same time, depending on how you're choosing to look at it. So when I was working at prb and as a cataloger, I cataloged things in such a way you could tell that they, the book was interesting for more than one reason. Though this concept of the importance of multi-layered interest was initially introduced to me in my library program at Indiana University. But before all that, I've always had a deep love of things that other people might consider ugly, especially if I can use them in a way to talk about broader themes or historical events. Thank you so much for your time. I think we're now at the Q&A portion, Diane. That sounds just about right. Thank you, Colleen. That was super fun. And I love the stitching on the, on the spine of that book. So we have a few minutes for questions and answers. Um, I have been monitoring the Q&A and commentary in the chat. And gosh, thank you all for your appreciation of um, the various presenters and their selections. Um, 
before I get to the questions from YouTube, if the speakers want to ask each other or just comment on each other's amazing presentations, you have the floor. Excellent job, everyone. Just, just wanted to get that out there. Fantastic. As I switch from devices. Okay, so let's see. There were a few comments of appreciation um, on Julie's presentation. Um, the one and only Debs Coltham said that it was lovely viewing the plate of Kent from actual Kent. So appreciation in that regard. Um, we also have a comment from Kim Schwenk, who was on our previous panel in uh, September. Um, Kim just sent merely the heart eyes emoji, which it gives me great pride to read emoji um, to all of you. Also, Nancy Rosen notes, that Jonathan, you had a lovely message um, and thank you for sharing that wonderful collection. There was a lot of feedback on that collection. Um, but let's see, for Agnes, we had a couple questions about your collection item that you shared. Um, first, is there any work going toward digitizing those audio tapes that you know of? It's done. They are digitized. They have been digitized since the 80s. Fantastic. Uh, they are available on a website called Music Rising. Um, and I can drop it in the chat um, for the audience. But they That'd are, uh, yeah, they've been digitized. They are freely available. Um, majority of them have transcripts or summaries of the um, interviews mm -hmm. uh, with the um, uh, with also the lovely uh, transcription errors that are also telling um, in their own special way. So yes, um, the, the oral histories are available. And the project, I don't know if I mentioned it, but the project of collecting the stories continued um, till the about the 80s um, and then it stopped because money. Great, that was me. Bad, bad moderator. Um. <laughs> Fantastic. There was actually there was a nice comment in um, the chat from Bill Fisher, who said that it was nice, a very nice acknowledgement of the interviewees as co-creators of the Jazz Archive. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Bill. I have to agree. One thing that struck me while listening to you all is that um, everyone's been at at least one other institution that kind of influences what how you view the new materials at your current institution. So I don't know if this is particular to anyone. Um, Brendan, you are the person with the shortest tenure at your institution, but I was wondering if you could all talk a little bit more about how your previous institution influenced how you um, see material with new eyes at your present place, or maybe how that changes your instruction. Quick comment for me, uh, I recently came to Queens, as you mentioned, uh, and I was previously at the Royal Ontario Museum as librarian there. Uh, so coming from a museum environment uh, into an academic environment, certainly uh, looking at the book as object and looking for evidence of, of readership, um, those kind of uh, specific um, things that make, make the book unique, um, I think coming from a museum environment in particular was, was certainly helpful uh, and, and opened my eyes to, to that aspect. Sorry, that's great, I was muted. Um, Colleen, did you wanna to add to that? I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I was thinking, um, so because before I moved into this position, I was working for an antiquarian bookseller in Philadelphia. Right. And through that, I was doing a lot of work at book fairs and emailing and talking to people on the phone and working with visitors, which has really helped me reframe how I work with undergraduates in that, um, you know, you're not like selling things to them in a very literal sense, but you're selling things to them in another way. And so that's how I approach it. <laughs> Thanks, Colleen. You can see uh, for everyone, just Colleen is in her office and it's a marvelous double height space that unfortunately we can't share with you right now, but that accounts for some of the echo you just heard. Um, 
All right, it is almost noon, which means it's time for the opening of Getman's virtual bibliographic, um, bibliophilic gift fair. So we do have to wrap things up. I think we have time for one more question. So let me just quickly check. In the meantime, I want to thank the panelists for this wonderful session um, and thank Getman's Fairs for inviting us all to be here today, to Neko, our producer who is unseen to most of you, um, for keeping us looking good, and to everyone out there who attended. Let me just check our chat. Ooh, okay. We have one more question. It's from Diane Shaw, and she says, the scrapbook and travel photos diary presented by Jonathan makes me wish I made such a scrapbook for my own life. Lovely that she documented the everyday so well for what sounds like a fabulous life. So I guess that's more of a comment than a question. Yeah. Everyone should record their ordinary lives. Do it. And I think that's perfect on which to end. Um, so once again, thank you to all the presenters. You are wonderful and amazing. And it's been a joy to work with you. Um, wear a mask, everybody. Protect yourself and your communities and have a marvelous Friday. We hope you enjoy the fair. Thanks.